Welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, bringing the tales and stories of the ancient Celts to your fireside. Special episode number two, Midsummer 2008, part one. Hello, welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. I'm Gary. And I'm Ruth. We've got such a lot for you in this special episode that we're going to skip the normal contact details. You'll find them at the end of the show as usual. So what have we got in this show? Well, this really is a big episode. We've split it up into two halves for you. The next half will be available towards the end of the week, just before episode 11 is due. What have we got in it? Well, we've got a little discussion about Midsummer, a section from Religion of the Ancient Celts from Sacred Texts, a passage from the book Fairy Healing by Margie MacArthur, a wonderful tale of the origin of the Silky by Willie Meikle, a poem, some music, and a musical gift from some friends of ours, and to top it all off, our main feature in part two is an amazing piece from The Fires of Belenus by William Russith. Not to be missed. So we'll start off with some news and views. So it's midsummer. It certainly is. On the 21st of June. Yep. It's traditionally the 21st of June, although although I was reading on the web earlier this week that um, some people see it as the night of the 20th, between the 20th and the 21st, rather than the 21st and the 22nd. Has that got anything to do with the Shakespeare tradition, you know, the, the Midsummer Eve business? Um, I don't know, actually. No idea. Uh, I just I was just doing a little bit of reading and found sure. that um, so, uh, a lot of people celebrate it on those particular I'd always thought that it was from the 21st to the 22nd. 22nd, yeah, that's right. But apparently 20th to the 21st, a lot of people celebrate. I notice there's an awful lot of festivals and fairs going on, and it'd be really nice to, you know, be mobile and and, uh, have the ability to go down and visit some of these places. There's a fairy one in Cornwall. there's There's a folk festival going on in Devon. There's something else going on in Kent, I think, but... And uh, across the pond, they've got lots of things going on as well. Well, as for the fairy festival, it's traditionally a time for fairies, isn't it? Of course mid- it is. Of course it is. Back on, to Shakespeare again. That's right. And midsummer night, they come out and they dance. And sometimes if you're very lucky, they'll take you away to their world and you get some time there as well. Yeah, though aren't there myths that when you go to their world, you don't come back again? Or you come back and lo- lots of time has passed here, but that doesn't pass there. And Oh, there's lots of folklore about different like times. Um, some people have gone away for what they thought were two or three days, and come, came back, and it was 50 years later. Sure. Um, but I think all we can say is that the, the fairy realm probably has a completely different time sense than, than us, <laughs> <Absolutely>. actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing about midsummer, of course, is it, it is midsummer because it's a time of the solstice, and that is the time when, as the sun goes around the earth, well, no, actually the earth goes around the sun, but... <laughs> Shush now, shush now. But as we look at it, the earth appears... No, I'm still getting it wrong. As we look at it, the sun appears to go round the earth. You're wibbling, aren't you? I'm wibbling, absolutely. But basically, what happens is that because of the wobble in the earth's axis, the sun appears to not just go round the earth, but go up and down. It wobbles as it goes round. Mm, interesting. So it's kind of like the rings of Saturn and how they orbit Saturn. If You know you've got this visual picture of the rings. Well, if you tilt that on one side, it's kind of like the orbit of the sun. Oh, oh, the Earth orbits sun. But never mind. But the highest point is the solstice. Cool. And that was observable by the ancient Celts. They observed that and said, right, okay, this is a special time. I have something else to say about this as well. What's that? The, uh, we unfortunately didn't see the moon on the full moon just before midsummer, a couple of days ago, uh, because it was cloudy, crowd- wasn't, cloudy it? wasn't it? Yeah. But there's an optical illusion that happens with that moon I found out today. Really? Where the moon seems an awful lot bigger than it actually is. Good Lord. Um, and apparently it's only that moon it happens on. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, and I, I don't know why it happens, and I suspect there's people out there who can, who can actually explain it, but it's, it's quite famous, that moon, apparently. Shame sure. we missed it. Although yeah. last night, saying that, we went out and the moon seemed huge as well, didn't yes. we? Yes. Yeah, very much so. 
Um, the other thing that I think about Midsummer that is quite fascinating, um, where the ancient Celts are concerned, is that um, most people think that there are eight major festivals in the year, and yet we hear from the ancient Celts that there were four, the four main fire festivals. Well, it seems that how many festivals there were depends on which part of the Celtic realm you came from. Oh, really? Mm. And so some people were four, and they, they did the main four fire festivals, plus the solstices. Some did the solstices and the equinoxes. So it's not... Well, we know that the solstices were important because of the stone circles and the alignments of the sun at midsummer. That's the other thing that's interesting, because there are lots of different places all over Ireland, for example, that are linked to a specific festival. Yes, also um, places in Scotland, I believe, and of course the very famous Stonehenge. Yes, yeah, that's true. Callanish in Scotland is one, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. They watch the moon from there and stuff, I think. This is Philippa Ballantyne from Chasing the Bard, the podcast novel. And you're listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, the number one favourite podcast of Fay Everywhere. Round about the 22nd of June is the time of the Midsummer Festival, more commonly known as the Summer Solstice. Um, we get the name from the Latin sol and sistere, which means sun and standing still. That is, that its movement from north to south seems to completely stop. We also know this time as the longest day. Winter solstice, of course, is the shortest day. Um, so let's find out a bit more about how the Celts viewed Midsummer. And to do that, we'll have a look at The Religion of the Ancient Celts by J.A. McCulloch, originally published in 1911 and available at Sacred Texts. The address, as always, is in the show notes. The ritual of the Midsummer Festival did not materially differ from that of Beltane, and as folk survivals show, it was practised not only by the Celts, but by other European peoples. It was, in fact, a primitive nature festival, such as would be readily observed by all under similar psychic conditions and in like surroundings. A bonfire was again the central rite of this festival, the communal nature of which is seen in the fact that all must contribute materials to it. In local survivals, mayor and priest representing the earlier local chief and priest were present, while a service in the church preceded the procession to the scene of the bonfire. Dancing sunwise around the fire to the accompaniment of songs which probably took the place of hymns and tunes in honour of the sun god commonly occurred, and by imitating the sun's action may have been intended to make it more powerful. The livelier the dance, the better would be the harvest. As the fire represented the sun, it possessed the purifying and invigorating powers of the sun, hence leaping through the fire preserved from disease, brought prosperity, or removed barrenness. Hence also cattle were driven through the fire. In the Stone Age as with many savages, a circle typified the sun, and as soon as the wheel was invented, its rolling motion at once suggested that of the sun. In the Edda, the sun is the beautiful, the shining wheel, and similar expressions occur in the Vedas. Among the Celts, the wheel of the sun was a favourite piece of symbolism, and this is seen in various customs at the Midsummer Festival. A burning wheel was rolled down a slope or trundled through the fields, or burning brands were whirled round so as to give the impression of a fiery wheel. The intention was primarily to imitate the course of the sun through the heavens, and so, on the principle of imitative magic, to strengthen it. But also, as the wheel was rolled through the fields, so it was hoped that the direct beneficial action of the sun upon them would follow. Similar rites might be performed not only at midsummer, but at other times to procure blessing or to ward off evil for example, carrying fire around houses or fields or cattle, or around a child, deosil or sunwise, and by a further extension of thought, the blazing wheel, or the remains of the burning brands thrown to the winds, had also the effect of carrying off accumulated evils. Midsummer's Eve is also well known to be a time when the fairies are out and about, and to bring us right up to modern times, here's a small excerpt from a modern book by Margie MacArthur called Fairy Healing. The Law and Legacy. You can find links to her book and website in the show notes. This excerpt is from Chapter 5, which is called The Irish Traditions. 
In this chapter, we will examine the Irish healing traditions as evidenced in the collected folklore and look at some of the beliefs and practices and especially at that most fascinating of characters, the Fairy Doctor. A very brief history of magical healers in Ireland. Although in later years Irish doctors became familiar with medical information and healing practices of the great Greek and Roman healers, later still, even becoming conversant in Latin, the most ancient mode of healing procedure in Ireland was the religious medical mode of herb cures, fairy cures, charms, invocations, incantation and magical ceremonies, quite possibly originating, as we've said previously, with the Druids. Interestingly, during the Christian era, priests were held to have the ability to cure, a belief which possibly may have been a continuation of the earlier belief in the healing abilities of the Druids. Many of these procedures and charms were preserved traditionally by the people and handed down through families. Since the profession of physician was hereditary in certain families, the O'Lee, O'Shiel and the O'Hickey families among them, this accumulated law was usually handed down from generation to generation in these families in the careful way of oral transmission, hands-on teaching and example. Similarly, blacksmiths and millers were held to have power and people sometimes went to them for cures. Those who practiced these professions were seen as powerful because, by the virtue of their professions, they held the power of transformation and worked with the very elements of life. Smiths who worked with fire, water, air and the ever-powerful iron transformed the hardness of metal into useful objects by the use of these elements, a quite magical thing to do. Millers, likewise, transformed hard kernels of grain into useful flour for making bread, the staff of life. Millers used water and water wheels in their profession. Thus they worked not only with the life-sustaining power of water, but the sacred round of the water wheel which brought in echoes of the circles and cycles of life, the turning earth, the swirling stars, the wheel of the seasons. Both millers and smiths utilised all the elements in one way or another, but smiths are predominantly associated with fire and millers with water. Even within the safekeeping of these blacksmiths, millers and hereditary physician families, the healing law became fragmented over the course of time, and some of it was lost. By the end of the 19th century, with the rise of modern medicine, many of these charms, herbal cures and folk healing practices, now diffused into the hands of many beyond the original healing families, were regarded simply as so much superstitious quackery. Although the more honest of the new doctors were forced to admit the efficacy of at least some of this quackery. William Butler Yeats, felt that the Irish country people's belief in the fairy folk was really a religious belief since fairies are spiritual and invisible beings. The people believed that fairies were a race of invisible beings living all around, having a life very similar to human life, and having the ability to take from our human world people and animals as they so desired. Yeats thought that this belief had its priesthood in the fairy doctors, who were also called knowledgeable men and sometimes cow doctors, since they treated fairy-afflicted cattle and other animals as well as people. Women fairy doctors were sometimes referred to simply as fairy women or wise women. These fairy healers, and indeed even the more ordinary medicine men and women, were treated with great respect, and it was thought that women derived their knowledge from the fairies and the spirits of the mountain. In some instances, the line of demarcation between fairy doctors and herbal healers was a bit indistinct, as herbal healers often used charms and fairy doctors were known to use herbs as well. One of the people interviewed by Yates and Lady Wilde mentioned that the herbs with which fairy doctors cured were so natural and normal that you could pick them at all times of the day. An important distinction, however, is that fairy doctors alone held the secrets of magical and mystical uses of these common herbs. Indeed, the fairy doctors possessed many secrets which they'd learned from the fairies. They were disinclined to talk freely about them as they lived in terror of the fairies who often punished and hurt them when they did talk too freely. Fairy doctors often were good herbalists and able to offer herbal cures for illnesses but could only work their specific fairy healings on fairy-caused ailments which they must always first diagnose as such. Yeats felt that the fairy beliefs had blended with Christian beliefs though they predated them and thus were able to exist harmoniously side by side with them. That was great. We'll take a short break now and listen to Shimmering Wings by Gaelic Wind Project. Mm -hmm. 
Seven children were born a long time ago As children of royal breed Their mother she died before they could grow Leaving their siblings in need Six brothers, one sister, both noble and fair They lived with their father alone Their love and their lives they did happily share Till the seed of their fate was sown A lady named Tuna came to their place, a sorceress in disguise. She caught their father in a net of false grace, made swans of the brothers before the girl's eyes. Shimmering wings in the open sky, a movement. Set apart, set apart from the human race. A beautiful sister, Soka by name, was told to release the spell. She had to make shots out of nettles and pain and stay them like the death of the well. She worked on the cloth till her fingers did bleed in the forest she stayed day and night. When one day a pack of fever young men of her body took vicious delight. She fled to the arms of a passerby who took care of the silent girl. He took her to England and there she did stay as she loved this precious pearl. In England she did not abandon her quest to free the enchanted birds. She sold, kept silent and did not take a rest to get their feet back to the earth. The people in England did not understand both magic and witchcraft they feared. They piled up a wooded stake so grand because Sarkis' behavior was weird. The logs were burning at Sarkis' feet when she'd almost accomplished her work. The love for her brothers pervaded the heat and the crimson sky became dark. Shimmering To fly, set apart, set apart from the human race. Through the smoke filled air, the swans appeared, called their sisters work in flight. The spell was broken, their lives were saved. It was a magnificent sight. Soka declared her love to a man, but now her voice did resound. To Ireland they all did return, where the home of their heart was found. Set apart, set apart from the human race.
Willie Meikle is a Scottish author who writes fantasy and horror fiction and has eight books published. Many of his stories and books are set in Scotland and are weathed with mythology and folklore. Willie has had 130 stories published in the genre press, both in paper and online magazines, and his work has appeared in the UK, Ireland, the USA, India, Greece, Romania and Canada. He has graciously allowed us to present an excerpt from his novel, The Midnight Eye Files, The Sirens, and it concerns the origins of the Silky, a fey creature able to shift from seal to human form. Ice meets the sea, and the great white bears prowl for unwary travellers. There was an island of seafaring folk, who were renowned for their prowess in fishing. It is said that every time they took to their sea, their nets bulged heavy, so heavy that they had to throw back more than twice what they were able to carry. Nothing that swam in the seas was safe, for the men were so gifted that no shoal could hide from them. Across the seas of Midgard, their sails blew tight in the spray, and their songs swelled with the wind as they hunted. So big were their catches, so bountiful were their tables, that their fame at last reached as far as Valhalla, to the halls of Odin himself. And even Odin, the master hunter, was in awe of the exploits that were related at his table. But the tales were so tall, seemingly so exaggerated, that the old god would not swallow them, for he had heard many tales over his long years, and was wise enough to know that the teller was just as important as the tale itself. So he sent his son Loki to find out if the stories were true for Loki was a teller of tall tales himself, and would know a lie if one faced him. Bring me the truth of it, Odin said, and Loki smiled sweetly, though the truth was little more than a passing stranger to the trickster. For long months he searched the circling sea, and many great and mighty things did he learn and everywhere he went he heard tales of the great fishermen of the north, who had risen in greatness so far among the other seafaring folks that they might even be gods themselves. And Loki saw this, and was enraged that mere fisher folk might usurp the place of the mighty in the hearts of common men. After long journeys he came to the land of the fishermen on a sunny day in summer, and saw the nets bulging with the heron, the silver mounds filling the harbours and inlets for many leagues around. And the townsfolk saw him, and took him in, and there was a great feast. Ragnar, the king of the fisherfolk, took Loki to his side at the high table, and there was much talk of fish and fishermen. The ale flowed freely, and talk grew loose. King Ragnar, Loki said, rising from his seat at the table. You are truly a great hunter. Surely Odin himself would not take so much in his nets. 
Now Ragnar, who cared little for the ways of the gods, grew boastful. No disrespect to your father, lad, but he is a land hunter. No one is better on the water than I. I can catch anything that swims, he said. Now Ragnar's daughter, Marna, was a great beauty, and Loki had his eye on her throughout the feast. So when Ragnar made his boast, Loki laid his trap, for he had seen a way to take the girl, yet still explain himself back in Valhalla. I have a wager for you, King Ragnar, the god said. On the morrow, we will take to the boats and I will show you what I wish you to catch. If you succeed, I will promise to tell Odin himself that Ragnar is the king of all fisher folk. And if I fail? If you fail, I take the hand of your daughter Mirna in marriage, the god said. Now Ragnar saw this as a wager where he could not lose, and the king and the god shook hands on the deal. On the morrow they took to the water in the boats, and all the menfolk of the people went with them. Loki took them to the south, to lands they had never before fished, in seas that they had never before sailed. And great was the bounty in the waters, where the shoals of herrings stretched for miles, and the whales dived in their hundreds. And what is it you wish us to catch, my lord? Ragnar said to Loki. And Loki smiled, for he had a secret. I shall have a special catch for you this day, King Ragnar. And suddenly all around their boats, the heads of seals bobbed in the water, their plaintive cries echoing across the water. But these are no sport, King said. Nevertheless, these are your wager, Loki replied. So the fisher folk went to it with gusto. They sang as they hauled the catches in, and soon their nets were full to the bustling with screaming seals. But their songs soon turned to wails. For as their catch left the water, the seals began to change into wives and daughters, into mother and sister, the women folk of the fishermen, now all gasping for air. And like fish out of water, Loki said, and laughed. <laughs> King Ragnar ordered the catch put back, but he was too late, and the bodies of the dead floated around them. All save one, a single seal that sang a plaintive song of loss and sorrow as the men in the boats wept. It seems you've lost the wager, King Ragnar. It seems uh, I have to tell Odin that I'm a better fisherman than you. Uh, for look, I have got myself a sea wife, your daughter, Merna. And Ragnar, in his rage, lifted Loki from the deck. But the god merely laughed and changed his form to a huge black crow, whose cawing laugh echoed long after it had flown to the north. And Loki returned to Odin, and told a tale of how the fisher folk had thought themselves above even Odin himself, and how he, Loki, had tricked them. But he did not tell of the deaths of the women folk. And although Odin knew there was a lie in the tale, he could not separate the bigger lie from the smaller one. And in time, the affairs of Asgard took precedence over the affairs of men. Far away in Midgard, Ragnar made a new home, there where his daughter swam and sang. And great was the sorrow of the people, for without the women folk, they grew old and died, and none followed them. And it came to pass that King Ragnar became an old, bent man, and he was the last of his people. And with his dying breath, he called down a curse on the sons of Loki, that they would come when one of Myrna's blood called, that they would be father and protector of Myrna's children, and that they would be cursed to serve the very line that Loki had tried to erase. And high in his halls, great Odin heard 
And now he knew of Loki's perfidy. So he sent to Myrna a song, a lay that would entice the sons of Loki. Even as King Ragnar's eyes were closing for the last time, he heard the song and saw on the beach a seal turn into a man, a man called to be the first, first of the sea husbands. Attended the open ritual with the Anderida Gorsed at Beltane. Yep, I remember. Um, we learned to chant. Ah, oh, that's right. We, uh, there, we we attended with three young friends of ours, Stacey, Tanya, and Jessica, and the girls really, really loved this chant. Um, so what we did was brought them in and um, we recorded it. It's not professional. These young ladies are our friends, and as a treat for them, I thought we might play it. I hope you enjoy it. Ladies, spin your circle bright, weave your web of dark and light. Earth, air, fire and water, bind us as one. Maiden, spin your circle white, weave a web of shining light. Stand and hawk, bear and wolf, bind. worth mentioning that it's midsummer the summer solstice for us because we're in the northern hemisphere oh yes for those in the southern hemisphere it's the winter solstice the opposite end of the year which i believe is around yule isn't it which is 21st of december for us it is yes yeah for them that this time is the winter solstice oh yeah because the months (laughs) (laughs) it gets very confusing doesn't Mm. it (laughs) Mm. i mean what would be interesting is that I mean, for us, it's holiday time. It feels really great. It's the height of summer. Um, there's new life everywhere and everyone feels good and is cheerful. wonder what it's like in the Southern Hemisphere for these people. Yes, it seems strange, doesn't it, in the, in the middle of... Um, I mean, their, their winter solstice. In the middle of winter while we're in summer and so on and so forth. Yeah, I wonder... The feeling must be different. 
I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's very so similar. Our, our to... winter solstice <clears throat> is kind of like all homely and warm and cozy, around, isn't it's it? Family time and around the fire. And I wonder if it's like that for them now. I used to have some friends in Australia who uh, celebrated their Christmas dinner um, on the beach. The beach. And I just can't get my head around that. I just mm, it, there's just a, in your turkey. Yeah, mm. something something a little bit odd about that. But that's possibly because I'm not Australian. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Different strokes, different folks. Absolutely. Well, that wraps up this episode, and until next time, Slon Gavoyle. What were you now, my dear brothers? We are near death. Let us rise up and get free shouts upon the hill, for I see the signs of death coming. <laughs> I can <know. laughs> Silence! I kill you! Before the release of our next episode, we're going to be releasing another special episode, our Midsummer... Our Midsummer Night Strong. What am I talking about? <laughs> Making it up as I go along here. <laughs> You've got Shakespeare on the brain. <laughs> I have, yeah. Brilliant. And that wraps it up for this episode. And the next time you'll be hearing us will hopefully be in the Midsummer Special. And our normal schedule programming will resume as usual. Uh, basically, I foobarred that, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know what you're on today, I really don't. <laughs> You've been listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, available from CelticMythPodShow.com. We hope you've enjoyed the show and will stay tuned for the next episode. You can send us a quick email or voice feedback by emailing either Gary, that's G A R Y, or Ruth, R-U-T-H, at CelticMythPodShow.com. You can chat to us in the forums on our website. The show notes for this episode can also be found on the website. We'd like to say a special thank you to Kulan's Hound, who provided us with the theme music for our show. You heard Hag Hole at the beginning and are listening to The Skylark now. You can find out more about this foot-stomping band at www.sfhounds.com. And thanks again to Diane Arkinstone and Kim Robertson, whose music has been used for some of the incidental music in this podcast. You'll find links to their websites in our show notes. <laughs>